Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great privilege to be here. Thanks, uh, Steve and the elders, Jackie. Uh, we love the Wimbles dearly. Uh, Steve and I, for around about a three-year period, were doing some postgrad studies, and it just so happened that we had to go down to Cape Town, and uh, ev every time we went there, it was over my wedding anniversary. So uh, three years in a row, uh, I phoned Sue from Premier Restaurant under Table Mountain, saying I'm enjoying a wonderful, wonderful, romantic anniversary dinner with Stephen Wimble. <laughs> and uh, uh, we boast about you guys all over the world, Steve and Jax, and uh, it's a great joy to be here. Thank you for entrusting us with the responsibility. I'm actually a Hillcrest boy. I went to Hillcrest Primary School. And uh, so I, I always, Sue said to us when we're driving into the town, she says, you love coming back to this village, don't you? Go back a long way with Eric and Jill. Used to live on their, uh, my folks uh, lived on their property for a couple of years. Oh. This is how I got saved. I was 10 years old, living in Botha's Hill. I had two brothers. One nine, one eight, both of them with me at Hillcrest Primary. And one night, my dad came through to our bedroom and he sat the boys down next to me and he was extremely emotional. I hadn't seen my dad like that before. And so we knew something was up. So he said to us, tonight, boys, your dad has given his life to Jesus Christ. So we didn't know what that meant. But we knew it was serious. And so he said, and so you boys must do the same. <laughs> and so we said, yes, sir. <laughs> we got on our knees. So I don't know when my dad's faith recently into the background and it became my faith. But I do know that by the time I was 12 years old, I had been water baptized in a swimming pool down here on Hillside Road. By the time I was 13, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in Green Meadow Lane, in one of Eric's sheep paddocks that he had there. And so by the time I was 13, the faith of my father had become my own faith. And so my testimony is not one that God rescued me from drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Hillcrest Primary School boys weren't into that. My testimony is that God got hold of me when I was 10, and he's held me ever since. If you've got a testimony that God rescued you from a seriously distracted and disrupted life, that's a fantastic testimony to have. But for those of you who are raising your kids and bringing them here to children's ministry in the kingdom, you can hold on to Proverbs 22. You train them up in the way that they will go. And he can hold them and he will hold them for the rest of their days. My, my two brothers are both in the ministry uh, in England leading churches. And my dad is still on staff with us. God is in the business of changing lives permanently, permanently, permanently. Fast forward seven, eight years, uh, we relocated up to Peter Maritzburg and I uh, finished my schooling there and really didn't know what my life was meant for. I was saved, but I really didn't know what God had in store for me. So, my strategy was probably not a very wise one. I just threw myself at everything I could. So I studied and I bought houses and tried to build houses and worked in the corporate world at the same time opening a couple of businesses, was involved in leadership in a church, carried on playing sport, fell in love with a lady, married her. My life was hectic. And, and sort of at the age of 24, I just ran out of batteries. was just... I actually did not go and see a doctor, so I don't know what condition they would have, you know, described me as being in, but I was desperate. Went into a very, very dark hole for about three or four months. I think my wife thought, who is this creature that I've married? He looked like he had everything together, now he's falling apart. And the Lord took me one day. I mean, I went out. I'm probably understating the gravity of the situation I was in. I would pray every single morning, God, take me home. 
I would never have taken my life because of a conviction in my heart, but I was desperate, desperate, desperate. And God got me to Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 4. And this is what it says. Come to me with prayer and thanksgiving. In other words, you come to the Lord asking Him and saying thank you. There's something about lifting your head up and starting to say thank you like you did in your prayer today. Come to me with prayer and thanksgiving and I will give you peace. It's a gift. That morning I, I saw it was a gift that came from God, just like my salvation had come from Him. I will give you peace that passes understanding. Now you can get a peace through understanding, and there's nothing wrong with that peace. You can get a peace through counseling. That's a peace through understanding. You can get a peace through taking various uh, medicines, and, and that is a peace through understanding, a medical understanding, and there's nothing wrong with that peace. But he says, I will give you a peace beyond understanding to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And so that's more than half my lifetime ago. It took a couple of days, but I felt like a peace of God come upon me, clear up my mind, sort out my emotions, and from there to today, I'm the grand old age of 52 in a couple of days' time. God has held me, and His peace has held me together. It got to the point of me having to surrender and saying, actually, God, you know what? I'm trying as much as I can, but I'm making a bit of a mess of it. I'm not only going to surrender my soul to you, I'm going to surrender my future to you, I'm going to surrender my thinking to you. And as I got to that place of surrender, it's like His peace came upon me and has held me ever since. I felt Him saying to me, Grant, I have created you, I've made you, and I have plans for your life. Now, I'm a bit of a palooka, not very gifted and God somehow got hold of me in that place of surrender. And while I've made many, many mistakes, this conviction sticks with me. God made me, and He has plans for me. And that's my message for you this morning. It's, it's a very, very simple message. God has made you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And He has devised plans for you. Collectively as a church, but I'm not talking to, to you collectively as a church. I'm talking to you individually. Often when a message comes like this, you think I'm talking to that guy eh? next to you. Because many people say, look, I I'm not very gifted. You know, I know God might have something for me to do, but I'm going to have to sort of button up my game before he can use me. Now, God's not talking to that guy today. He's talking to you. So some people say, well, you don't know how I've messed things up, Grant. I, I can remember sitting talking to a guy once, and his marriage was falling apart. And he said, you know what, I messed things up when I was younger, so I married this girl, so now I'm living with plan B. I said, say that to me again. That lady you're talking about is plan B. It's a misunderstanding of how magnificent God is and how able He is to take the scraps of your, your life and do something glorious with it. In your marriage, in your job, in your kids. God's more than able. You say, God, but I'm just a significant little guy. I'm waiting for my big moment. I'm waiting for that opportunity. God hasn't pitched up with it yet. I'm standing in the background. Not only has he, has, has he plans for your life overall, He has plans for your life today, tomorrow. Let me illustrate this with a story that took place a couple of weeks ago. We do church at multiple places at the same time. That's just the way God's led our particular church. And the way we start these sites is that elders generally come and say, we've got a heart to do something in that area, and if they've got people that want to support them, then we say, okay, go for it. So this guy, his name is Reba, came to me and said, listen, I've got a heart to go to this area called Shia Bazali, which is an informal settlement in Howick. He said, Grant, do you know that 
those people mainly come from Lesotho. They speak Sotho and they collect it together. It's safe for them. There's 6,000 of them. And they squash between a rather prominent factory, the Howick Golf Course, and Howick Falls. If you go to the Howick Falls and you have a look over that vantage point, you will see Shias behind you. So I said, really? Isn't it informal? Like there's no electricity, there's no water, there's no sewage. He says, exactly. I want to go and preach the gospel there. So we went there and had a look. I said, where are you going to meet? They're just like tin shacks. He says, you see that flat crown tree? We're going to meet there. So, so they started around about a year ago. And it didn't take very long until, you know, there were about 100 adults meeting there. And then they found another flat crown tree and had children's ministry under the flat crown tree. Just far enough not to mess up noise-wise. These people come out sitting on their paint tins and on crates. In the wind, in the rain, they pop up a few brollies. In wintertime, they moved out from under the tree because it's cold in Howick. Anyway, one day, a guy got saved who sweeps the floor in that factory. And so he came to Reba and he said to Reba, I've got the email address for the boss of that factory. If I give you that email address, why don't you write to him and ask if we can put a container on the land there because they own most of the land that the people are squatting on. And then we can have chairs and then we can have a sound system. So Reba says to him, hey, listen, if you give me your boss's email address, isn't your job in danger? He said, nah, don't worry about my job. There's the email address. So the email address got to me. I wrote the letter. I didn't think anything would come of it. And nothing did for about seven, eight months. And then a couple of weeks ago, I got a reply from the authorities at this factory. They said they wanted to see me. So I loaded up a couple of pastors. We went in there. This factory's been there for more than 100 years. And they were sitting up in their fancy boardroom. There's two massive Dutchmen standing in front of me. And uh, it became apparent that these guys didn't live in Howick. They didn't even know the name of the informal settlement. So I said, well, where are you from? They said, no, we're from Pretoria. Turns out we're dealing here with the CEO and the FD of this company. So I don't know where that guy got that email address. (laughs) He either pulled it out of a scanning machine or out of a basket somewhere i have no idea but he had the ceo's email address from pretoria so we're sitting around the table and he he says okay so what do you guys want so i said look before we tell you what we want can i tell you who we are so i described the guy sitting next to me was a pastor who had been a street kid and he had come into a meeting very similar to this that we were having about 15 years ago he'd got radically saved now married with a graduate, had a child. The guy didn't seem very impressed. But we told him anyway, we're having these meetings and we would love to extend it to be able to minister during the week, etc., etc. She says, yeah, yeah, but what do you want? So I said, well, could be one of three things. Firstly, we could put up a container and and then we could just, you know, keep chairs in there, etc., etc. And be able to, you know, do our ministry more effectively? He says, yeah, that's probably possible. What's the the other alternative? So I said, well, look, I don't think you're going to get this land back. (laughs) There's 6,000 people living on it. What if you give us the authority to build a 350-seater auditorium on your land? Then we can extend the facility from a Sunday to other days of the week. So he laughed at that and said, that's a little cheeky. I said, what is... So then he said to me, what is the next alternative? So I said, well, that's easy. You build me the facility on your land. (laughs) At which he laughed just like that. I said, come on, you need to invest in these people. They're on your doorstep. He says, well, let's go and have a look at it. We walk down the stairs. As we're walking down the stairs, he says to me, by the way, you remind me of my pastor. I said, oh, you're a church guy. He says, yeah, I go to church. And I said, and you live in Pretoria? He says, yes. And I said, and I remind you of your pastor? He said, yes. So I said, well, I'm sure he's not a Dumini. Can I guess his name? So I guess his name. I get the name right. He says, how do you know that guy? I said, he's a good friend of mine. He says, well, listen, let me tell you what happened with me and that guy three weeks ago. 
Three weeks ago, um, my wife had said to me, let's go and try this church because we were in a mainline church and this, this is something's happening in this church. So I said, I was rather skeptical sitting at the back there watching what was going on. Anyway, three weeks ago, I went to a restaurant to have dinner with my wife. And who should walk in the door but the pastor of this church? And I thought to myself, well, here we go. Now I'm going to see what sort of a man this is. He doesn't know who I am, but I know who he is. And so I kept watching him, but I became very uncomfortable during the dinner because this guy kept looking at me. So I changed my chair around. Anyway, he finished first, and he came to pay his bill. But as he came to pay the bill, he had a wad of cash in his hand, and he threw the cash on my table. And he looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, Sir, God wants you to have this. I quickly shoved it back at him, and I said, I don't need your money. He said, it's not my money. God wants you to have this. Okay, bye. And he walked out the door. He said, I looked at the cash. I said to my wife, this is like hot money. Everyone's looking at me. It's like, I look like a bank robber. I look like a bank robber. It's like, it's just like a pile of money on my, my table. So we quickly paid the bill. I said to my wife, I said, listen, we've got to give this money away. I can't have this money. I went outside. There was no one to give it to. So I said to her, listen, Frankie, tomorrow we're going to go to that church and I'm going to ask that pastor why he gave me the money. So he walks up to him after the meeting. Now, I'm sure my friend was quite surprised to see that the fellow he had given money to actually knew where he was a pastor. He gives him back the money and he said, so I don't need your money. I want to know why you gave it to me. He said, Grant, he said something very simple to me. He pushed the money back into my chest and he said, I told you it was not my money. Jesus wants you to know how to receive from him. He said, God, I can't describe what happened to me. It was like in a flash. He said, I'd heard the gospel my whole life, but in a flash, I understood that being saved was something to be received. Salvation was something to be received, not something to be earned. He said, I can't describe it. He said, he said like, fire hit me. And he said, I became born again right there at the back of that church. My life has never been the same since. He says, I went home, and as I got home, I remembered your email. He said, your email was like in the trash can. But something quickened it to me, and I remembered your email. And so anyway, I've just come back from overseas myself, and he sent me a message about 10 days ago, saying, listen, our holding company, which is a... German holding company, has agreed with me that we go with option three, that we build this thing for you. And, and we sign over a 99-year lease because when I'm gone, then it's in your hands. So I would like to see you on Monday morning. I said, well, unfortunately, I'm overseas, but I can send the pastors. So I phoned them, and they were on their way, and I felt God say to me in my devotion that morning, send your secretary. Now, my secretary... Has, has like been my PA for nearly 20 years. She's quite a cheeky lady. But has nothing to do with that particular project. So she sat there silently while this was, discussion was going on. And they were standing on the land. And so the CEO says to our pastors, so how much land do you want? And they were a bit overwhelmed. So they said, listen, we're building a 350 square meter building. So 450 squares would be beautiful. She lurches forward and says, What? Excuse me, may I interrupt? Haven't we just signed a 99-year lease? They said, yes. Do you know what God can do in 99 years? <laughs> it certainly won't be contained in 450 squares. How about we have a lot more? He says, well, how much do you want? She says, how much can you give? He gave the whole bang shoot. <laughs> now, now, listen. That guy who swept the floor, if he had not been willing to put his life and his job on the line, pick up that email and come and make the connection, we wouldn't be there. If I hadn't written the email, we wouldn't be there. If that pastor of mine was sitting in the restaurant and he heard God say to him, give a whole lot of money to a rich guy. I mean, you know, 
You guys hear God say, give a whole lot of money to a rich guy. You think that's the devil speaking, eh? <laughs> Don't you know there's like thousands of people who need food? Shouldn't I give this money to poor people? No, actually, you know, our, our scale of poor and rich is all poverty in his mind, in his eyes. It's just degrees of poverty when you compare it to God and his, everything that's at his disposal. And so he says, no, what's going to unlock the CEO's heart is money. Absolutely undeserved, absolutely unearned, absolutely unasked for. Throw it on his table. It'll crack open his heart. If that pastor hadn't done that, my email would still be in the trash basket. And if that little secretary hadn't nuzzled forward, we would be operating on a postage stamp. Now thrown in actually is a soccer field included. God made wonderfully and fearfully that floor sweeper. And he has plans for him. God made that pastor and he has plans for him. God made my secretary and he has plans for her. God made you and he has plans for you. Tomorrow... Today. So let's go to the Bible and just make sure that this is not just a good story. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And so Paul spoke about your purpose as a believer all the time. The epistles and Romans. God doesn't just rescue you and leave you there. The Bible is... Full. The New Testament is full with God's instructions for you to get on and glorify Him in the way you live your life. So this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. For we are God's workmanship. The Bible teaches that every single human being is a work of art, has been wonderfully created, whether Muslim, whether atheist, whether Hindu, whether Christian, we have all been made in the image of God. That word workmanship in the original poema means masterpiece. For you are God's masterpiece. You say, Grant, I don't really think so. I was preaching in a church uh, last weekend, and a person came up to me and says, oh, it's you preaching, is it? I said, yes, here it is, it's me. He says, oh, I remember you, you the pastor with a nose. She was like a 17-year-old girl. I looked at her little button nose and realized why I was the pastor with a nose. You, you could say, I'd never been called that before, actually, but you can say, look, I'm not I'm not really a masterpiece. God, God made, he did not make a mistake. To him, you're perfection. He's made you wonderfully and fearfully. And he's the creator of the universe. And when he made your fingerprints, he threw the mold away. You are his masterpiece. But so is every single human. That's why the sanctity of life is prime in every constitution. Why? God's ensured it. You don't mess with a human being, a little baby, an old man who's reflecting in his image, the image of his creator. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But the Bible teaches that while we're his masterpiece, before we are in Christ, we're actually hanging there in darkness. We're in a darkened kingdom. Have you ever been to an art gallery at night? I haven't either. But I can imagine it would just be like any other dungeon at night. I've just come back from Abu Dhabi, and they've, 
taken the concept of the Louvre and they've made the Louvre there. Going into the Louvre in Paris, lights off, load shedding. You might as well be in a bunker somewhere. And that is the tragedy of the whole of humanity, masterfully created by God, but the wonder is masked by darkness. The glory is masked by darkness. That verse doesn't stop there. You, have, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. That describes what John 3 calls being born again. Be made a new creation. So what God does with his whole creation that's sitting in darkness, he gets the creation to a point. He gets you. If you are a believer in Jesus, what happened to you is that the Holy Spirit got hold of you, began, as you were hanging there in darkness, got hold of you and began to draw you to himself. And you got to the point where you surrendered. You got to the point where you said, okay, no longer me with the steering wheel of my life. I'm giving it over to you. No longer me in charge. No, no, me as king of my life. I'm gonna, you're going to be my Lord. When you gave up at that point, God came upon you, and John chapter 3 says, the Holy Spirit, capital F, Spirit gave birth to Spirit, and you became spiritually alive. You became created in Christ Jesus. And you moved from darkness into light. You were born beautifully in, in the image of God. And then you were born again. You were created in Christ Jesus, pulsating with the life of God. If you've come here today, and you know that God has fearfully and wonderfully made you, but you haven't fully surrendered, what's happening to you right now, it's not an accident that you're here. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to the point of surrender. And there'll be an opportunity after this meeting, and tonight after the meeting, for you to say, God, I surrender. And at that point of surrender, God breathes life into you. A Christian isn't someone who's changed his moral code. A Christian isn't someone who's decided to live a good life. A Christian is someone who's been made alive spiritually. You've been created in Christ Jesus. And now, it's like you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and you're hanging in the gallery of light. But this is the thing. God didn't intend you just to hang in a gallery as a masterpiece. He didn't make you created in Christ Jesus just to, to bask there and show him off. The lights are on. Look at the Christian. You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand. Before, where? Before you were even saved. God knew what the nose pastor was going to look like and my personality. And, and he laid out before I was even born things for me to do. Why? Because God has made you and he has plans for your life. You are his masterpiece not to hang there, you're his masterpiece, and he has plans for your life. His plan for your life. And those plans include and get you knitted into his grand design for the planet. What's he building in the planet? He's building his church. He's extending his kingdom. He's on a great rescue mission, rescuing your relatives and your boss and your neighbors out of darkness into light, and then he's getting them going. A church is not just a gallery of people sitting there in the light. Many churches are, and it's, it's, it's very sad that, because Paul adds at the very end of this verse, he's created these works so that you walk in them. Many Christians don't walk in them. They, 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 they go like this, surely you weren't talking about me, you were talking about those guys. Now, this message is not for those guys. This message is for you. God has made you in Christ Jesus, and he has tailor-made stuff for you to do. I'm telling you, that guy who swept the floor, part of his job was to reach into that waste paper basket, to pluck up the courage to go and talk to the pastor 
to insist that God has a plan. I'm telling you, that guy has got other things, the other side of that building. That you might walk in them. The reason people don't walk in them, I think, is because they think I've, I've messed up properly. Grant, you don't know how much I've sinned. I think a lot of people believe this. God is the author of life. God saved me, and I don't understand His grace, but I know I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. And God had lots of plans for me, but I'm busy stuffing it up. And so we put ourselves, we almost disqualify ourselves. Sometimes I think people don't walk in it because they're waiting for the big ship. I'm waiting for God to call me, like send me to India. Like make me state president. Like make me head boy. Actually, I think a lot of people just put the thing of God on pause and scratch around doing their own thing. And Paul saying, God, the creator of the universe, he knows better for your life than you know. I think some people think God's going to mess up their life. I know some young people think, you really want me to ask God who I should marry? You're going to make me worry, marry that ugly person. I don't know that God's idea of beauty and mine is the same thing. I know some people say, what, are you crazy? If I give my money to the Lord, I'm going to become poor. God, God knows how His river of financial provision works. And so we scratch along on the side, conscious that there is a plan, but somehow disqualifying ourselves to walk in it. And so what I'd like to do as I bring this to a close, is I'd like to ask the question practically, I know that I am created in Christ Jesus. And I have the suspicion that he has a plan for me. But how do I practically walk it out? Well, the first thing I think we need to understand is that this plan is not just a macro plan, it's a daily plan. Even when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said, ask for your daily daily food. What's he saying? Engage with God uh, about what's going to sustain you when you get up in the morning to give you that go. Talk to God about that. Why? Because he has a daily plan for you. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 puts it this way. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking, if anyone wants to follow after me, in other words, if anyone wants to Walk in the plans that I have for them. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. In other words, recognize that his plans are not really as cool as God's plans. Take up his cross daily. Not on the day he was saved. Daily. It's daily putting to death your wise ideas, and daily saying, God, daily I recognize you've got a plan for me today, people to, for me to speak to today, stuff for me to do today. You say, God, that's not my experience. I've had a lot of wasted days. We've just sold our house. We've lived in it for 21 years. And in Marisburg, I'm sure it's the same down here. When you sell a house, you need a rates clearance certificate. So I was in Australia at the beginning of the year, and uh, I get the bad news that my electricity bill is 94,000 rand. I'd never paid more than 2,500 rand for my electricity, and I've never been cut off, and I've never been late, and I've never, but 94,000 rand. You might have heard the Marisburg billing system is a little bit up the pole. So I said to my PA, please just go sort it out. There's obviously a gremlin in their system. She says to me, I can't even get in the door. So I said, okay, get hold of the lawyer, send the lawyer, tell him to sort it out. It's ridiculous. He gets back to me after two days 
and says, listen, I'm just butting my head up against a brick wall. This is what you do. You pay the 94,000 rand, and then you sort it out afterwards. I said in my best Afrikaans, foot sack, man. There's no ways I'm doing that. So I came back, and I tried the one day, and I just was, I hit the same walls. So now, listen, I've been living in that city since 1983. So I know people who know people who know people who know people who know the guy who has the power to change that bill. And then I found out where his office was, and I got a layout of the municipal buildings, and I found a way to get in by the back end, missing security, down the fire escape, back passageway, through another guy's office, at his door. So I got there, and as I grabbed the door handle, the secretary comes out. He says, do you want that guy? I said, that's the guy I want. She says, good luck. I said, what do you mean good luck? She says, because he works here, but we never see him. I look at things, and I'm thinking, you know what? The reason this guy probably hides away is because of the crisis. So he probably sees guys at his door and doesn't want to go there. So I looked, and there was a fire escape behind me. So I stood in the fire escape. I had this little iPad here. I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to spend the day preparing my sermon in the fire escape. And when he comes, I'm going to pounce out on him. Well, about two hours later, a little Asian lady arrived. She's about 70 years old, just over four foot. And I see her grabbing the door. So I lean out of the fire escape. I say, ma'am, are you looking for this guy? She says, yes. And I've got something to say to him. So I said, you know what? I'm first in the queue. And the queue starts here. She says, in the fire escape. I said, listen to my logic. She bought the logic, so she came to join me in the fire escape. <laughs> About a minute later, a dude arrives who had one arm. He grabs the door, swears at the door. So I lean out my fire escape door, and I ask him the same question. He looks at me as if I'm mad, and then he says, okay, I'll come. I said, look, you stood in the queue, but So he comes. And then my sermon prep stopped. This little auntie was moaning about how she was the only one who's going to defend herself. And, and then this guy started to tell us how he lost his arm and how proud he was that he's a self-made man. And he's done this and he's done that. And now his latest exploit is when he finds this guy, what he's going to do to that guy with his other good arm. <laughs> anyway, as the morning rolled on, a whole procession of people came. And of course, three's a crowd, so the whole fire escape was full before lunchtime. And I'm standing there, and there's a commotion going on. This guy's swearing like a sailor. The granny's moaning. Everybody's sitting on the steps. But the coast is clean. Just before the guy arrives, I shut my iPad, and I'm asking the Lord, Lord, this is such a waste of a day. We've got the planet to save. I've been away from in Australia. I need to, I've got people to talk to. Surely this can't be your plan for me to sit in a fire escape waiting for some bureaucrat who's obviously in trouble. And quick as a flash, I felt God say to me, I have made you and I have plans for your life. Now. I look at this little granny and the sailor that's behind her and I shut my iPad. I didn't know what to say, so I just bent down around about her height. And I said to her, ma'am, do you know that you do not need to defend yourself? She took off. Of course, I've got, I've got no husband anymore. I've got no this, no that. I want to go prepayment. I said to her, put my hand on her shoulder, and I said, ma'am, the Bible says, at that point, the whole fire escape went still. It said, the Bible says God defends widows. She says, does it say that? I said, yes, it says there in Romans, the back end of Romans, that you can actually defend yourself if you want to. But you shouldn't. You should leave room for God to do that for you. So she looks at me and says, well, could you pray for me then? Now, she didn't know what religion I was from. Oh, I suppose she guessed I was from the Bible religion. So I said, with pleasure. So she grabs my hand, at which point the one-armed guy grabs my other hand. <laughs> Felt very awkward. 
and the entire fire escape was busy interceding for this old granny. As we'd finished praying, the guy arrives at the door, I jump out, I pounce on him. And it just so happens that he was the perfect guy to talk to because after that whole ordeal, the municipality owed me money. So I come out and there's this little granny sitting there and she's so excited about what's about to happen. I didn't stick around and find out whether she, she made it or not. But I do know this. God made me. And while I was in that fire escape, he had a step for me to take. I don't know if she was Buddhist, whether she was Hindu. I don't know what religion she was part of. But I do know she's bumped into Jesus. Just bumped into him. That one on sailor dude, I'll recognize him again. And maybe that step was just to start the bridge. God has a plan for you daily. He doesn't intend for your life to waste away. It's daily. Secondly, we not only to walk with him daily, we to walk with him by the Spirit. And before you dial off, because it's a very spiritual thing to say, let me read this text out of Romans for you. We do not walk according to the flesh. There's two ways to walk. But according to the Spirit. For those who live according to their flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. And the flesh just means worldly things. But those who live according to their sp the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So, so basically, God is saying through the Apostle Paul that there's two ways you can live this life as a Christian created in Christ Jesus. You can have your mind set on earthly things and scrummage around in that environment or you can live in the world but have your mind set on something else. I was coming down to a pastor's meeting a couple of weeks ago that Steve and Jack were at. I was driving into town and I found myself praying this prayer. And the Bible says we to pray in truth and pray in the spirit. And I found myself praying this prayer. God, I pray for the swallows. I thought, swallows, where does that come from? I remembered Beatitudes, the swallows. There's not a swallow that falls out of the sky that God's not mindful of. And as I was driving into this pastor's meeting with their hundreds of pastors, I felt God say, there's swallows among them. The guys that are dropping, just about to drop, just about to pack things up. I said, in the, in the hustle and bustle, and pastors are always very excited to see each other and the leaders are all there. I said, God, show me the swallows. Even if it's just one, show me a swallow. And, and that was a spirit-led thing. I mess it up most of the time. But that particular day, he showed me a swallow or two. And part of what he created me to do that day was to notice a swallow. It wouldn't happen if my mind was set on worldly things, even if the worldly things were rushing down and delivering a message for leaders. Walk daily. Walk by the Spirit. And then walk in love. Ephesians 5, 1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. Walk. How do we walk? We walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself us as a sacrificial fragrant offering to God. Actually, a definitive distinction between the ways of the flesh and the ways of the spirit is love. Paul puts it this way to the Corinthians. He says, you can do a whole bunch of stuff, but if that love element is missing, it's an empty gong. You say, Grant, I don't really know how to do love. I'm not one of these lovey-dovey sort of guys. Uh, neither am I. I was brought up by a guy who shook my hand. My dad, I love him dearly. He loves the Lord, and he does love me, but he demonstrated it to me with a handshake. So, I'm not one of those who just naturally is able to demonstrate my love. Two Fridays ago, three Fridays ago, one of our elders lost a four-year-old daughter in a drowning. He's a dear friend. He's been in our church for more than 20 years. 
as we were racing to the hospital, she was, she was dead on arrival. I said, Lord, what do I do? Because there's no theology that helps with this. There's no wise words to help with this. And this verse just kept going through my mind. Just, just walk away of love, my boy. There was the wife trying to call life back into this little girl. The dad, numb. The staff of the hospital crying. What do you do? You can only love. We walk daily. We walk with our hearts set on the things of the Spirit and we walk in love. And one final thing as we draw this to a close. We walk believing. Jesus was asked this question. How do we walk? How do we do the works? That's what the disciples asked him. How do we do the works that you've called us to do? How do we do those works? That's the question we're asking right now. And then they said to him, what must we do to do the works God requires? John 6, 28. What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You see, we can, we can ask God daily. We can get our eyes set on God's kingdom. We can demonstrate love as best we can. But this is what Jesus said when he was asked the question. He actually didn't answer it the way I've answered it. He answered it this way. He said, believe, trust. Now, when you take that puny little step, that, that broken little step, trust that as you take that step, as you bend down and talk to that little Indian lady, as, as you take an email address and give it to somebody, trust that God can take it and he can multiply it and he can grow his kingdom and he can make it eternal. Believe. The way we use that phrase, we, we, we use that word faith or trust. God, my life is going to count. Why? Because not only did you make me, not only did you pour your life into me, that you said you had stuff for me to do, and as I put my foot in that stuff, I'm trusting that you take my little offering and you multiply it into what he is doing. What's Jesus doing? He's building his church. He's extending his kingdom. He's rescuing your friends and your families out of darkness. He has this massive mission to take those hanging in darkness, not only putting them into light, but to get them going. And your plans are mystically and eternally wound up in his plans. Why don't we could stand together, please? For you are God's masterpiece. And he has plans for you. He's made you, and he has plans for you. Imagine if this entire auditorium, as they step out tomorrow, steps out believing that God can take every step and make it eternal. And when we're battling with our own fleshly things, we say, God, I surrender. See, our, our purposes, just like God got hold of me when I was 24, he said, enough of that now, boy. Striving and straining and trying to get me to bless everything. Enough of that now, boy. Surrender to me. But the funny thing is that it's almost like daily or weekly I feel God doing the same thing to me. Eyes on me. Trust me. I'd like to pray for two groups of people and then hand this meeting back to Steve. Well, you could bow your heads in a word of prayer.